Hello, I'm Professor Ron Davis. I'm the director of, of the MECFS Collaborative Research Center at Stanford. I want to give an update on one of our research projects, and that is looking at the tryptophan to canarinine metabolic trap that may be the cause of MECFS. This project started because we noticed that all of our severe patients with MECFS had a mutation in a gene called IDO2. We then looked at a large number of other patients and they also all had a mutation in IDO2. This is considered a gene that's not essential for humans, but there is another gene called IDO1, which is essential. So we tried to figure out how in the world could you have a non-essential gene be a contributor to a disease. And looking through the past literature, uh, we discovered that the gene product for IDO1 is substrate inhibited, which means that the enzyme converts tryptophan to canurinine. And if the tryptophan gets a high concentration, it stops working and it doesn't make canurinine. IDO2, which is presumably a more ancestral enzyme, is not substrate inhibited. So we thought it would be possible that it could be the way that the, cell, the cells get out of the trap by having IDO2. However, IDO2 is not essential for this. It was just a possibility. Now, many people have, uh, have found that there are people that have this disease that don't have mutations in IDO2. Uh, in the population, many people have a mutation in IDO2. So some, some of the scientists have concluded, well, the metabolic trap can't be right then. And that is not true. And I wanted to emphasize that and cover that. And uh, it, it, we don't know if both IDO1 and IDO2 are on in the same cell. We don't know their level. We do know that IDO2 enzyme is, only works at a much lower, a higher concentration of tryptophan. And we don't know anything about the structure of the gene. So uh, it's not required. So therefore, we are just now focusing on the IDO1 enzyme and want to go to doing experiments to see whether this is a real feasibility. And one of those feasibilities is to say, can uh, uh, we put uh, a cell into the trap? And what we mean by a trap is that a cell imports tryptophan, and if it imports too much tryptophan, it starts to inhibit the enzyme. And if it does inhibit the enzyme and more tryptophan is continued to be brought into the cell, it can get to such a high concentration that it doesn't work anymore. And it's like a mutation, but it's an essential gene, so there's a problem. We also know that the tryptophan to canurinine pathway is very important for immunology, it's very important for uh, inflammation and controlling of inflammation. It's apparently very important for uh, protecting cells from its own immune system. And in fact, that is one of the things that happens in cancer. Cancer cells turn this pathway on and make uh, canurinine, which protects them from the immune system. So we know there's a lot of immune, uh, regulation problems in MECFS. So this is a, a great candidate to explore more fully. We also know that MECFS is most often triggered, but not required, by an infection. A, a lot of times in the United States, that infection is a virus called e, uh, EPV, and it causes a disease called mononucleosis. So what happens when you have a, a major viral infection? Tryptophan is released from the albumin and it uh, floods the, the cells with tryptophan and then tryptophan is imported into uh, a number of different immune cells and converted to canurinine. Uh, this can actually happen pretty efficiently. So there is a possibility that tryptophan could become too high and it could be that the cells get trapped and because they're trapped and cannot make canurinine, you lose regulations. 
So we know in the test tube, and this is all we know in the past, is if you take the enzyme and put it in a test tube and put in large amounts of tryptophan, you can inhibit the enzyme. And that's the early experiments were done in 1967. We want to know whether you can do this in a cell. And that would help to, and that, what we try to do, of course, is to rule out this hypothesis. We're not trying to prove it, we're trying to rule it out. So if we can't make a cell uh, shut down the pathway with high tryptophan, that will tend to rule it out. Now the simplest experiments to do is to do all this in baker's yeast because it's so easy to manipulate baker's yeast at the genetic level. So we've taken a yeast that has the human IDO1 gene in it that's under yeast regulation. And, uh, and we've taken out a lot of other genes that would interfere with this analysis. That's easy to do. These experiments were done by Angela Chu. Angela Chu uh, basically ran the experimental part of the uh, International Yeast Deletion Project. And so she's extremely familiar with all the uh, ins and outs. And, and in fact, we set up a lot of robotics to do the analysis of these deletions and we still have those robots, but they're very old. And we've had a lot of trouble getting those robots to, uh, to work again to do this analysis. Now, the idea behind this long term is if we can show that you can shut down uh, the pathway. And, and what, we've, what we've done here in this pathway is that we've made yeast uh, 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 absolutely require need to be produced so before it can grow. And that's, I don't want to get into the genetics of how to do that, it's, but in yeast it's fairly simple to do these kinds of things. So if the pathway shuts down and doesn't make canernine, yeast will stop growing. So uh, <clears throat> with our robotics we've set up, um, and I was going to do the filming in the room, but it was too noisy. So uh, we have achieved that first goal, and that is that we put in a, lot, a small amount of tryptophan, which is required in this cell type. Uh, we've taken out the genes so that yeast can't make its own tryptophan, and it can't use tryptophan for anything else. Uh, but if we increase the tryptophan in, in this cell, uh, it stops growing, and it, it simply shuts down and does not grow. Now, this gives us a tremendous opportunity because now we can look for a drug that will allow yeast to grow again. But that's very easy to spot. So uh, that's the next set of experiments that Angela is now doing. Uh, she's managed to fix the robots. It's taken a long time uh, to get an idea for simply to know a little bit about computers. This whole system was operating on Windows 7 and it was all custom built software and the person who wrote that software is no longer you know, working with us. So it's very difficult to change anything. But Angela has very cleverly figured out how to sort of bootstrap her way in and fix the robots, and they're now working. So she's now been screening FDA-approved drugs. Now, we want to do FDA-approved drugs, not look for a compound that will uh, Turn, allow us to turn this pathway back on, but we want to find an FDA drug that can do that so that it would not require a major uh, endeavor to allow it to be used with patients because it's already been approved for some other purpose. Uh, there are, we have 1,100 approximately uh, FDA approved drugs in our freezer. Those are commercially available. Um, and Angela has screened a, a third of those so far. And she has now found a number of drugs that will turn the pathway back on in yeast. Now, we have to make sure that that's actually what's happening. Uh, another possibility is, of course, is that these drugs have turned on drug pumps and the drug pumps have, in fact, pumped out the tryptophan. Uh, this is going to be fairly easy to, to sort this out uh, uh, with yeast. We could even delete some of those genes if we need to. So now we have a number of drugs that in fact seem to turn on the, the pathway. 
Probably what's happening is these other compounds bind to the IDO1 protein and, and block whatever is causing uh, the high tryptophan to turn the, the enzyme off. There's a couple of models for why that is. We don't need to know what is the right mechanism to do this. So we will continue to screen and find uh, the compounds that seem to do this. We will then look through this list of compounds with their structure and try to find some common feature. That will be, if we find a common feature, it's much more likely uh, that this is a, a, an important uh, part of the reaction. We can also look and put this into an in vitro test tube reaction and block the enzyme and then add these drugs to see if it turns the, the, the enzyme back on. So the, what also we need to do though is to see if this works in human cells. So we have been working with uh, macrophage uh, derived from monocytes uh, from blood draws initially with healthy people that will now start to do uh, patients. Uh, it's been very difficult in the past during the pandemic because patients did not want to come into the lab uh, and they didn't even want to come out to because uh, they're really vulnerable uh, and to, to give a blood draw. Uh, we have set up a blood, a blood draw station outside the lab, so it's uh, very uh, open and much less dangerous. Uh, they don't have to come into the lab. Uh, and uh, some wonderful patients have come in and still donated this blood and it's allowed us to get started again. One of the problems is that for many of the experiments we do, we can't freeze the cells. They need to be fresh blood. And so that is always a hard thing to do. But we have uh, some preliminary data now that suggests that, in fact, uh, human cells can be put into the trap. So uh, we're getting close to being able to test this hypothesis uh, in an in vivo situation. So I'm, I'm kind of excited about this. This is a possibility. But again, all we're trying to do is to say the metabolic trap is not right so we can move on. But so far, we have failed to do that. And so we're continuing to pursue it. And to, for those people who think that we've ruled out the metabolic trap, we have not. Now, keep in mind, we are also identifying another, a number of other metabolic traps that could possibly be important in this disease. And those will be explored when we have the capacity to do so. So thank you very much for listening.